Welcome back. Uh, next up is Dr. Eric Walk, the Chief Medical Officer at Path AI. Eric is head of the medical group overseeing medical affairs, regulatory affairs, and clinical affairs at Path AI. Um, he has over 20 years of experience in precision medicine, oncology, drug development, and IVD companion diagnostics development. Prior to joining Path AI, he was the Chief Medical and Scientific Officer at Roche Tissue Diagnostics, uh, Ventana Medical Systems, where he led medical and scientific affairs. Uh, Eric began his industry career at Novartis Oncology, where he held positions in early clinical development and translational medicine, working to implement biomarker and precision medicine strategies for early and late stage targeted oncology therapeutics. He's board certified in anatomic and clinical pathology and is a fellow of the College of American Pathologists. He is currently a member of the CAP Personalized Healthcare Committee. Today, uh, Eric will be discussing the power of AI-based computational histopathology methods to improve clinical development effectiveness. Eric, a pleasure having you with us today. And uh, without further ado, over to you. Thanks so much, Nigel, for that uh, very kind and comprehensive introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here today at the Precision Medicine Leaders Summit. Um, and Nigel and I were talking before the session that it's really a great opportunity to uh, explore the exciting areas outside of oncology uh, toward precision medicine. So as Nigel mentioned, the topic of my talk today will be to focus on computational AI histopathology methods and really show some examples of how these methods are um, are pretty dramatically changing and improving uh, drug development processes and effectiveness. I'm gonna start just with a couple slides uh, to give you a bit of an overview of the company I work for, Path AI, give you a sense of the mission and the portfolio. Uh, so the vision of the company is, is quite simple, and that is to improve patient outcomes with a powered pathology. Uh, and we, we firmly believe based on the data that we're seeing that we can do this, there are opportunities to do this in several areas that you can see on the slide. Starting on the left uh, with traditional biomarker directed uh, therapies in oncology, outside of oncology, there are a lot of opportunities to improve the assessment of these biomarkers, which as you probably know, uh, in some cases are highly variable. Uh, so both the reproducibility and the accuracy of those biomarkers can be improved uh, with AI technology. Uh, secondly, uh, in, in the middle pane here, there's definitely an opportunity to improve the diagnostic process, if you will, the bread and butter uh, aspects of um, clinical histopathology. Um, certain diagnostic entities are, uh, are highly variable, and I think there's an opportunity, for example, to develop h &E algorithms uh, that assist pathologists in making the, the best diagnosis. And so by doing both of these things, uh, we hope to get to the third panel on the right, and that is enabling optimal treatment uh, for each and every uh, patient. And so, for example, I would not be surprised if in the near future we have companion diagnostics that are based on AI and machine learning technology. To give you a little bit of a, a sense of the Path AI uh, portfolio, what would our focus areas? Uh, so we've developed AI machine learning algorithms um, across many disease areas and biomarkers, and you get a sense uh, here. Uh, we do work on oncology, um, and there you can see a heavy focus and emphasis on immune oncology, cancer immunotherapy, um, but also traditional targeted therapy. Um, today I'll be talking about the liver space, specifically non-alcoholic steohepatitis, or NASH, uh, but we've also developed uh, models for sclerosing cholangitis and hep B. Uh, and then there are other areas uh, outside of oncology, uh, for example, in the inflammation area. Uh, so IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, we see as a, a really exciting opportunity. Our work is a bit earlier there, but I, I think there's a lot of potential to uh, improve the, the state of the art in that disease area. So as I mentioned, um, now I'm going to transition into the talk itself and really focus on NASH. And for those of you who are not familiar, um, NASH is the, the more aggressive uh, form of, of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, that is progressive um, and can be uh, deadly, leading to cirrhosis and death in some cases. There are no approved uh, drugs yet, uh, but there's a lot of excitement and activity in the drug development space uh, to help these patients uh, with uh, NASH. So I'm going to separate my talk into two parts. 
In the first part on the left here, I'm gonna talk about how AI pathology can enhance um, what pathologists already see. Um, and this applies um, to NASH, but also outside of NASH. But for NASH, we're talking primarily about reducing um, the intra and inter-observer variability in metrics such as the NASH CRN score or the NAPLD activity score. And I'll show you examples of that. Um, and in the inset there, you see the example of the output of one of our models. So this is the NASH model. Um, this is a heat map where uh, the yellow is highlighting areas of steatosis, uh, blue ballooning, and green lobular inflammation. So these are key components of the NAS scoring system um, that can help guide pathologists to those areas and help with score and reproducibility. In the second half of my talk, I'm going to uh, give a couple examples of uh, how AI um, uh, is, is going to be used in the future to reveal things that we cannot see. So in my opinion, actually, this is the future um, and, and really the more exciting area uh, to access information within tissue biopsies that perhaps human pathologists uh, don't have access to because they require calculations of relationships between uh, elements in the biopsy that are just not feasible. Um, so I'll give a couple examples uh, that show how these methods can increase sensitivity to measure treatment response uh, and progression regression, uh, and also identify features predictive of treatment response. So I'm gonna start on the left side and give you a couple examples uh, of, of how AI can improve um, measures that pathologists already are using. Um, and I'm gonna do this in NASH. Um, before I get into it, I'll, I'll give a, a little bit of an introduction to the NASH uh, field focused on scoring. So as you may know, the FDA has recommended liver histological um, endpoints um, in trials. Uh, and you can refer to this guidance document uh, if you want to read about that more. So these endpoints uh, take the form of um, two scoring systems primarily, the uh, NAFLD activity score or NAS, that's on the H&E stain and the NASH CRN, CRN fibrosis uh, staging score uh, that you see on the right. And that's um, using the trichrome stain. Uh, so for the NAS score, uh, when you break it down, it's an eight point system broken down into three areas, uh, three parameters, inflammation. So this is lobular inflammation, uh, ballooning degeneration and steatosis. And you can see for each of these measures, uh, there's a subscore, so zero to three for inflammation, zero to two uh, for ballooning and zero to three for steatosis. Um, and then I'm not gonna go into the scoring itself, but you can imagine just looking at how these scores are determined that there might be some difficulty in achieving good reproducibility. And that's exactly what we see. So for example, ballooning is particularly subjective where one means few and two means many. Over on the CRN fibrosis staging side, it's a four point uh, system. And again, using the uh, level of fibrosis detected in the trichrome stain. So uh, not surprisingly, uh, these uh, parameters are difficult for pathologists to read reproducibility uh, reproducibly. Uh, and this is um, supported by many studies looking at uh, the ability of pathologists uh, to repeat these scores um, themselves or between pathologists. So both intra and inter-reader variability um, is, is quite uh, high. Uh, and as an example of that data, you can look at this uh, dual data set from Kleiner et al. Uh, he re essentially repeated the same study uh, 14 years apart, once in 2005 and once more recently in 2019. And you can see these kappa statistics show that for all the uh, scores that I showed, all those parameters, the, um, the agreement uh, is fairly poor and really hasn't changed over the 14 years between the two studies. So this really sets up the problem statement for uh, AI and machine learning. So what we've done is developed an AI measure of NASH that we call AIM-NASH. Um, so this is an, actually two models, uh, one for the H&E slide for the NAS score and one for the trichrome score. Uh, slide uh, for the CRN fibrosis score. So these were developed using a large number of annotations, over 100,000, collected from nearly 6,000 biopsies from six completed uh, trials in NASH. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of, of how the models are created, but suffice it to say uh, that the H&E uh, model was uh, developed using convolutional neural networks 
and the trichrome CRN fibrosis model was used um, more of an end-to-end -end, uh, approach. In either way, what you end up with um, is the ability of these models to predict with good accuracy uh, and reproducibility um, the uh, NAS score and the fibrosis score. And uh, we have uh, submitted this tool, the AIMASH tool, to both the FDA and the EMA as part of the biomarker qualification process. Uh, so once qualified, these will be considered drug development tools and can be used uh, in any clinical trial as long as the uh, context of use is maintained. And I'll, I'll talk more about that a bit later. Um, the uh, drug development tool report we envision will look something like this, where the uh, algorithm will output the traditional NAFLD activity score and the CRN fibrosis score that you see here. Uh, in addition, the drug development tool will provide additional exploratory features that sponsors can use for exploratory uh, analyses. And uh, I'll highlight some of these and some of the data that I'll show, for example, continuous scoring, portal inflammation, and the uh, area of fibrosis and bile ducts. In terms of validating the tool itself, um, this is one of the uh, earlier validation sets that we um, performed. Uh, used 631 biopsies from a phase two clinical trial. Um, it compared the performance of the machine learning in NASH model to three uh, CRN, uh, which is uh, clinical research network pathologists. Uh, and as you can see uh, in the data, the agreement of the machine learning model uh, with consensus was superior to agreement uh, among pathologists. Uh, and you can see the improvement uh, in blue versus the, the uh, open circles. So I'll get now into some clinical trial data using uh, retrospective data from um, pre-existing uh, drug trials. So this first one I'll show you uh, is highlighting the ability of this tool um, to help with drug response prediction or determination. Uh, this was in the phase two Falcon 1 study. Uh, and for those of you not familiar with the study, it was a study of uh, Peg Belferin versus placebo. There were uh, around 200 F3 NASH patients enrolled, so four study arms, placebo plus three doses. Uh, and baseline in week 24 liver biopsies were scored both manually and with AI. Uh, and what you can see in the uh, data uh, with the PATH AI ordinal score on the right and the manual score on the left is that. Uh, even though visually it appears that um, there's a difference between placebo uh, and the treatment arms uh, for both data sets, um, it was a um, is only statistically significant uh, with the PATH AI ordinal score. So a significantly greater number of primary endpoint responders was detected relative to placebo uh, patients by PATH AI ordinal scoring, but not by manual scoring. In addition. In data that I'm not showing, the path A ordinal scoring, but not the manual scoring, detected a statistically significant difference in the proportion of treated versus placebo patients who improved in hepatocellular ballooning and lobular inflammation. So it appears that um, the majority of this benefit actually comes uh, not from the fibrosis improvement, but actually from the NAS uh, score improvement. Another interesting part of this study was to explore the use of continuous scoring measures. And so what we saw here is that PATH AI continuous scoring demonstrated um, statistically significant improvement uh, from baseline for the PGE-BF uh, treatment arm compared to placebo for all three NAS components. And you can see uh, this difference here. So the baseline versus week 24, um, and uh, the axis here is mean percentage change uh, from baseline uh, for ballooning. I'm now going to shift over to the, um, the other part of my talk to focus on some examples that highlight how AI can be used to reveal what pathologists cannot traditionally see. And I think this is a really uh, exciting uh, area. Um, and I'll start with um, this study. And this is uh, using the uh, fibrosis and bile duct area percentage patterns. Uh, and in this trial, this was uh, looking at the ATLAS phase 2B study of 392 uh, F3 and F4 patients. And what you can see um, in the uh, data, and this was an exploratory uh, measure in the study, 
is you can see a shift and you're looking at the uh, percent area difference post-treatment, so at week 48, representing the change post-treatment. So you can see a, a shift in the fibrosis patterns. So you can see a decrease, and this is both, both for the um, uh, celofexor uh, and the, for, for Silcostat arms uh, individually and also in combination. So you can see a decrease in the percentage F4 area and uh, a uh, associated um, redistribution, if you will, of that pattern into the uh, lower stage F2 pattern. So nice demonstration of a, of a drug effect. Uh, in addition, on the right, we also saw um, looking at the uh, ability to look at uh, the area of bile ducts, uh, a reduction in uh, bile duct uh, reaction. And so you can see that reduction here uh, for CELO and for the combination. Um, I'm gonna actually go back a slide because I think uh, I, I missed this one, um, but I wanted to highlight um, the ability of the AIM-NASH uh, continuous score to capture heterogeneity. Uh, so this is another example of the future that pathologists would have a lot of difficulty uh, detecting, at least uh, accurately. So what the AI measure does in this uh, case is not only detect the overall ordinal score, which in this case is uh, F4 as determined by manual, um, but it, it can actually detect pixel by pixel the fraction of fibrosis that falls into the other categories. So a lot of cases have areas of heterogeneity, as you can see here. So in this particular biopsy, what we're looking at is there are F4 cases in red, um, F4 areas in red, but there are also a substantial uh, amount of, of the biopsy that is considered F3. So you can see the orange areas here uh, and a small amount of area that is considered F2. Um, and what the score does, it creates a weighted average that you can see here. So it uh, takes the fraction at each um, stage and multiplies it by the percentage area to come up with a, a weighted score or continuous score. So which in this case is 3.44. So there's a lot more information here than in a traditional ordinal score. Um, but despite that, we still maintain a strong correlation with uh, ordinal scoring. And this area of fibrosis measure can be used in a, uh, a lot of different um, ways. Uh, this is one example uh, where we apply this to a retrospective data set to uh, associate area of fibrosis with progression. Uh, so in this case, what we saw is that the area um, of F4 can be used as a prognostic factor. So these patients were more likely to progress um, to cirrhosis um, when they started as F3, uh, which may sound intuitive, but it's good to see this borne out uh, in the actual data. And another interesting um, point in this data set is that among the non-fibrosis related parameters, a higher proportion area of ballooning and portal inflammation was also associated with a progression to cirrhosis. So another exploratory feature um, that is uh, more difficult for pathologists to assess uh, are our ratios uh, of features. Uh, so in this example, we explore the ability of the ratio of portal to lobular inflammation um, uh, to predict clinical disease progression. And so you can see the uh, algorithm identifying the portal inflammation here, and then it uses the lobular inflammation uh, calculation to create a ratio. Um, and when we looked at the outcome data, uh, this ratio of portal to lobular inflammation was uh, associated with clinical event uh, versus uh, non-clinical uh, event with the higher ratio uh, associated uh, with, with more clinical events, clinical events being things like uh, transplantation, death, uh, GI bleeding due to portal hypertension, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, using a cutoff of 40, uh, we use this to stratify. So using this as a predictor for event-free survival, and you can see the difference in this kepler meyer curve with a hazard ratio of uh, 4.5. So another example of how these exploratory features can be used to uh, predict um, drug response and uh, in that case, progression. In the um, last case that I'll show, 
Um, this is, uh, I think, really representing the future uh, where we used machine learning models uh, and combine that information with transcriptomic data, again, to create a new way to predict disease progression. Um, so this one is a, a little bit involved, so I'll take you through it a bit slower. Um, so this data set came from the Stellar 4 trial, which was a trial of uh, roughly 800 patients in the F3 to F4 uh, stage. Uh, and what we did is first applied the uh, AIM-NASH machine learning model to identify areas of portal inflammation and bile duct proliferation, uh, two features that are known to be associated with progression. Uh, we had access to the sample, so RNA was extracted uh, from these samples and used to quantify the expression of over 16,000 genes. Uh, and then an integrative network approach was used to look at the correlation between the uh, machine learning derived features of portal inflammation and bile duct proliferation and correlate those um, to the different genes uh, to see what correlations existed. And that's represented in this network plot. So you can see, for example, uh, there were some genes that were not connected at all. Those are in green. There were some genes that uh, were connected to the ratio uh, of bile duct uh, area only, that's in purple. There were some genes that were only connected to uh, portal inflammation area, that's in blue. And then there were, interestingly, some genes uh, that were connected to both uh, histologic features, so both bile duct area and portal inflammation, and you can see those in orange. Uh, so the 16,000 genes was distilled down to five key genes that you can see here, JAG1, CFTR, ITGA3, et cetera. And then that gene signature, that five gene signature, was then used as a predictor for progression. And there you, on the right, you can see this Kaplan-Meier curve. Um, so in this particular trial, there was a median follow-up of over 15 months, and there were 2% of subjects that had liver-related uh, events. Um, and this five gene signature identified a high-risk cluster that you can see here in the red line. Um, of F4 subjects that high higher risk of clinical events uh, with a hazard ratio of uh, just over four. So this is really interesting because um, this discovery of these five genes could lead to uh, investigation of potential new drug targets, uh, or as you see here, potentially could be used as a predictor of outcome and prognosis. So um, in summary, this is my last slide. Um, uh, what I've showed you is, are several examples of how AI-based histopathology in the area of non-alcoholic stale hepatitis can be used to uh, explore new ways to benefit uh, clinical drug development. And we feel that uh, these tools can be used in all areas of uh, disease, but uh, in this example, really a lot of exciting data in the area of NASH. So um, what I've showed you are examples uh, where these measures can be used to uh, investigate drug activity. Um, for example, the heterogeneity measure that I showed you, um, these methods can be used for more precise patient selection and classification. Um, and that NASH-DDT um, tool, uh, we hope, will be used for patient enrollment. Uh, and then finally, uh, as I showed you, uh, these tools can be used for more accurate and reproducible uh, measures of different endpoints, either traditional endpoints or new endpoints that are discovered in the future. Uh, and those can be used to standardize histopathology scores uh, that are traditionally prone to variability. And all of these things we hope leads to more meaningful and efficient clinical drug development. So I believe I'm on time and left time for questions. So I will stop there. Um, please reach out to me via email if you have additional questions or want to talk further about any of the data that I showed. Um, but at this point, I'll turn it back over to Nigel to see if we have any questions from any of you. Eric, thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. Uh, very insightful. Yes, we've got some questions for you. Um, and uh, well, dive straight in. Uh, were, were the model training data representative of all disease uh, severity stages and grades in your studies? Yeah, thanks for the question. So it's really important as we develop these models to have them as generalizable uh, as possible uh, and also powered uh, with all of the 
um, all the cases at different stages and grades that we need. So yes, to answer the question is yes, we've worked very hard to uh, train these models uh, using, in the case of NASH, uh, cases representative of all, uh, all grades and all stages. Uh, at the same time, I'd say, you know, there's always an opportunity to improve these models and we'll continue to, to do that by adding more data uh, as we go forward. Excellent. Um, how are tissue and image artifacts handled by the models that you're using? Yeah, another great question. So that sounds like that one came from a pathologist um, because anyone who's spent up time looking at slides, especially from clinical trials, knows that there can be artifacts in these slides, artifacts like um, stain fading, uh, tissue folding, uh, even ink marks, because pathologists like to mark the slide, there can be um, uh, smearing. Uh, and so we, one of the first models actually we developed was an artifact detector. So it's really important to not have these models train on these artifacts. Uh, you want to exclude those from the training process. So that's actually one of the first steps that we do. And we have a, a very comprehensive model uh, that weeds out all of those artifact areas. So that's a, a really good question. Excellent. Uh, what will be the context of use for the approved drug development tool that you are intimating? Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I didn't um, include that in the presentation, so it's great that someone's asking about that. Uh, so just as a backgrounder, the context of use is similar to the intended use for uh, an IVD product. So this context of use is a term being used both by the, the FDA and the EMA to uh, define how the drug development tool will be used. And in the case of our NASH drug development tool, um, which is not yet qualified, so we're in the middle of the process. So we don't know, I can't tell you what the final COU will be, but what we're looking to have that read uh, is that this tool can be used both for enrollment uh, in NASH clinical trials and also endpoint assessment. Uh, so that we hope will be the context of use. Great. So overall, um, what are the areas of growth that you foresee? Uh, I know you mentioned oncology being, you know, one of the areas that uh, we're not talking about today. Um, but what are the areas of growth that you foresee um, for Path AI moving forward? What, what specifics if sure. you can with us? That would be great. Right, right, right. Yeah. And I know this is not an oncology meeting, so I'm so tempted to talk about a lot of oncology areas. Uh, but outside of oncology, in addition to NASH, which uh, I spoke about today, um, you know, th this technology can be applied in a, 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 to any disease area. So we, we're really looking for those areas where um, in drug development, in the clinic, where histologic endpoints are variable and causing issues in selecting patients for therapy um, or developing drugs in the first place. Um, one area that we're looking at um, is inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so IBD, the measure of crypt abscesses, mucosal healing, et cetera. Um, and it may be an area that could be explored in a similar way to what I just showed uh, with NASH. So that's really early work, but I, I, I think that's an emerging area that is of high need um, and therefore of high interest to us. Excellent. And uh, I know Path AI are doing, doing some very creative things, but just more on a, on a personal level, you've been involved in, you know, precision medicine for, for many years. How have you seen the, the industry sort of grow and evolve uh, over that period of time? And I'm sure you, you've noticed, as, as we have at the Journal and the, the summits, that, uh, you know, the last three to five years have been, you know, quite impactful. Yeah, no, no, thanks, Nigel. It's a really great observation. I, I, I think a lot about this, actually, because, you know, I've been very privileged in my career, you know, joining uh, the industry, you know, with, uh, I started my career at Novartis in oncology, uh, and then spent the last 16 years with uh, Roche. I really have had the opportunity to see precision medicine grow and evolve over time. And of course, 20 years ago, we, we were talking about, will biomarker stratification be the new standard in drug development? Of course, that's uh, happened. I, I see a lot of parallels um, between um, the way biomarkers were implemented in the drug development. Um, I, I mean, and when I say biomarkers, I mean assay-based uh, biomarkers. Um, and I, I see a lot of parallels to how AI-based biomarkers will also be uh, adopted. And we're trying to see that transition from used primarily in retrospective translational settings 
more into perspective settings uh, and even into IVD settings and companion diagnostics. So I, I, I see a direct parallel. Um, hopefully the, the transition to sort of AI-based measures and drug development won't take the, because it was really, if you think about it, 10 to 15 years that evolution took for assay-based biomarkers. So hopefully we're gonna be a bit quicker this time around.